why am I introducing the white rabbit to this channel? And of course this is a reference to Alice in Wonderland. Like she follows the white rabbit down the rabbit hole and everything is completely goofy and weird and out of proportion and just doesn't quite work. And of course it ends up being a dream. But the reason I'm doing this on this channel is because I think we need more really creative, goofy, wacky, unfeasible, unrealistic ideas floating around the table about economics. Like, I think we need creative economic thinking to the point where we get ourselves out of the economic rut that we've been in, in terms of thinking of economics only as it would have been in the past. Like, we have really new tools with the digital environment and platforms and artificial intelligence and blockchain. So we need some creative ideas. And I actually think that will necessarily mean that a lot of these ideas have to be completely not feasible, not workable. But the purpose is, if you have enough of those ideas on the table, you can actually construct something that is powerful for the future. Like, I don't think ideas about economics and about institutions and economic structuring, I don't think those are going to arrive in anybody's brain fully formed. And what that means is, it, it means we have to be okay with not fully formed, half-baked, completely wacky ideas if we want to eventually find something where we can pull pieces from all of these different economic thinkers to construct a really new system. So I would like to talk a little bit about how I arrived at this conclusion, first by talking about left brain, right brain stuff. And then finally, I just want to mention four books and my experience with those books as it relates to the need for creative economic thinking. So first, left brain, right brain stuff. So when I teach students about writing and when I prepare them to do these economic term papers for me, I start out with the notion of the shitty first draft. And that is the idea that you actually need to just sit down and vomit up a whole bunch of ideas onto the page without thinking critically about them if you want good ideas in your final paper. And I relate this to left brain, right brain stuff. And if you've read the book, The Master and His Emissary, which is an amazing book um, by Ian McGilchrist, it actually talks uh, about what is the left brain, what is the right brain, where the notion is the right brain is sort of the part of the brain that is aware of the whole landscape intuitively and can sort of... Um, sort of like scan the landscape for what is important to pay attention to. And I even think when I walk through the forest, when I'm walking and hiking, that part of the reason that refreshes my brain is because forests are sort of full of this complex landscape where your brain is scanning it perhaps for dangers, like where is the danger I need to be paying attention to? And for beautiful things like where is the flower that I need to notice? But it's doing that in a way that engages, I think, the right brain and engages um, the senses in a way that's more intuitive and, and whatnot. And then the left brain is more about zooming in, critical thinking, um, it's more about like power in terms of like, what do I need to do to actually accomplish this goal? So of course, in The Master and His Emissary, he's making the argument that uh, the right brain needs to be the master and the left brain the emissary because the right brain can scan the landscape and essentially determine the salience frame for the left brain. Like the right brain can determine what is important enough to hand over to the left brain and pay attention to. So that's the framework for the shitty first draft is that you need to just get your ideas out first with using your right brain without allowing the left brain to come in and think critically and basically criticize the right brain. Because essentially the left brain, if it does that, if while you're writing and generating creative ideas, if the left brain can come in and say, that's a bad idea, this needs to be fixed, you're not following the rules of writing, if the, if the left brain is allowed 
to apply its critical thinking, it will stifle the right brain's creativity. So you just need to get ideas on the table. And then once you have that shitty first draft, then you hand the whole project over to the left brain and the left brain can, you know, organize it, think critically, pick out which of these ideas are worth keeping and which ideas in here are garbage. Like the left brain knows how to distinguish between the baby and the bathwater. And it's, it, it's good at creating a final product. But it's really, really necessary to separate those two stages in writing. And I think the same is true in, in all kinds of creative endeavors and creative thought. And people don't always think of economics as being a creative endeavor. But I absolutely think if we're going to figure out a new system in this new digital environment, in this new world that has uh, lots of interconnections between people, there's so many different things about this economic environment that we need some creativity injected. And to do that, I think we need to just, I, I think we need to just generate ideas that that don't even work. Yeah, like I have some videos that I would like to create of economic ideas that I think are completely not viable, but I think these could get us out of the rut in terms of thinking of economic systems of the past. Now, there have been three books and one article that I've read in the past few years that have really helped me come to this conclusion. And one is The Network State by Balaji Srinivasan, and he basically imagines a future where you have these digital mini governments that start out like startup businesses as startup uh, networks, startup states, and they grow and they gain traction and they compete with each other because there's free entry and exit from these mini online governments. Um, that was such a creative, fun idea that I think is tapping into some of the different properties of the current economic system. And of course, when I read it, there's many times in the book where I get the reaction, actually, this is not feasible. There are some properties of how people work and systems work that would make this not work. But I think him laying it out as he does, with all of its flaws and weird things about it, that really got my own brain thinking. And I think we're going to need different types of thinkers, thinking in different spaces, coming up with different visions, to have enough raw material on the, the table to actually make systems work. The second book that got me thinking like this was The Once and Future Worker by Oren Cass, where he essentially looks at uh, the landscape of unions and how worker unions have been kind of disempowered. They don't really have the ability to negotiate against government. And so he comes up with this creative solution to that that involves basically the government subsidizing low-wage workers, but doing that through a like worker industry group. Like it could be all construction workers, they come together and uh, they get to negotiate with employers overall, bringing with them the power of that subsidy that otherwise would not happen if it didn't come through this worker group. And, you know, when I read that too, there are some reasons why I think that as a, as a full idea that he presents in the book would not work. But I think there's also embedded in that some, some truths about the need for group cohesion and group power and economic forces that, that stick the group together and create that cohesion. That's a really important uh, principle that we need to keep in mind if we're redesigning the economic system of the future. And then the next book that got me thinking on these lines was The Listening Society. And this book, it has so much that's really, really brilliant, especially in the last half of the book. Um, and I'm not even gonna go into what the brilliant stuff was here. But the first two hours of listening to that book on audiobook were basically him insulting the audience, psychologizing about the audience, saying, if you reject this idea, it's probably because you have this character flaw, this deep-rooted character flaw, and if not that, if you reject it for a different reason, it's this other character flaw, and it's just <laughs> it's like super annoying to the point where it's almost comical going through that first part of the book. Like, because he has 
amazing, brilliant stuff after that. But you kind of have to persist through this, uh, <laughs> this weird, insulting, semi-pathological stuff at the beginning in order to get to the brilliant stuff. And I was thinking, like, why didn't an editor just tell him, get rid of the stuff at the beginning, it's not valuable. And I could totally see this author being like, no, I'm not going to publish the book unless you let me tell the reader how, how horrible they are, all of that stuff. But I think this gets at the notion that a lot of... Um, a lot of these thinkers who spend a lot of time in the right side of the brain space, um, a lot of them cannot tell the difference between the parts of their ideas that are brilliant and creative and needed and the parts of their work that are completely just like coming from a part of them that's, that's not in touch. I think a lot of these brilliant people cannot tell the difference. So I, I think if you were to try to say, okay, you can't participate in the conversation unless you get rid of that junk at the beginning of your book. I think you would actually lose the brilliance of what they have to contribute. And I'm not saying I'm in that category or I'm in that category of brilliant, but I'm saying I want the freedom to actually just play around in right brain space in a way that is unique to me, perhaps has some of my own biases built in because I don't believe in convergence of everybody who's thinking creatively about economics. I think you need each person embodying their own space that has its own biases. And then the last article, it's not a book, it's an article, that really got me thinking about this was Data as Labor which I have a video on, I'll link to it below. I'll also put links below to all, all of these books I've talked about. And this one was really thinking more about the meta structure of economics, about sort of property rights and how property rights are enforced, how the law enforces economics. And I think we're going to need to restructure things at that meta level from an economic perspective. And I mean, this maps onto the old enlightenment where the old enlightenment um, thinkers really came up with the importance of property rights of a certain type. And property rights is this legal structure. It's this way of um, enforcing things through institutions that would enable economic uh, activity in various ways. Now, I think there's a lot of different types of property rights that each have their own way they're being enforced. And some of them are going to be really, really important for protecting human rights and for protecting like human creativity and enhancing that. And then others, other ways that uh, property rights have been perhaps sliced and diced and enforced in certain ways um, may need to be rethought. So I, that's just part of what we need to do if we're going to restructure uh, a vision of the economy that might move us into a better future.